So I need to stretch the legs a little bit. But so what I'm going to try to do in these 15 minutes is to introduce four concepts, four cases, and one tool. And I have 15 minutes to do so. So I need to stand up in order to be moving. So the transparency and accountability movement is the larger setting in which I place this and of which anti-corruption is part. And I would suggest that this transparency and accountability movement has really taken off in a massive way over the last 10 years. It's become a truly global movement, which is one of the fascinating aspects of it. And what brings this movement together is a notion that the core accountability institutions in the liberal democratic state, and three of the core institutions are elections, the judiciary, and the media, have far too often failed to do their job. And so no one is saying replace those, but they're saying we have, they have to be complemented by something. Because on their own, they're not doing a sufficiently good job. When these three institutions are corrupted, then we're really in trouble. We really need to do something else. And so that's, I would say, is the essence of this movement, is trying to complement these three fundamental failings that have happened in far too many countries, including many industrialized rich countries. Now, the challenge, one of the challenges of this movement is intuitively we know that more accountability, more transparency, better government, more open government, less corrupt government are all good things. And we can give some indication of what it means to do more of those things. But the link between improvements in those areas and actually a better outcome, that link, there's no common unit of measurement for that. Right? We can tell that there are more contracts now there. We can say that there's a good access to information law. We can maybe have an intuitive understanding that perhaps there's less corruption in a certain sector. But how that translates into better social outcomes that's the link we were looking for. Now, what I want to propose to you is this notion of the fixed rate as that link. So what is the fixed rate? Well, to define that, we have to define a fix first. The definition is very simple. It's the resolution of a problem to the satisfaction of the main stakeholders. Now, it has a little bias in it. So it's one, it's focused more on outputs than on inputs. And the second is from our perspective as an organization, but I would suggest in a development setting, is to have a pro-poor perspective as well. So then the fixed rate is the percentage of identified problems that are resolved. Right? Sounds very simple. But now let me try to illustrate it. First with the data from our work. And the policy or the working paper is outside for you to pick up. But so we've done this work in a number of countries. And what we can show you is so we've done it in infrastructure projects and public services. And the fixed rate on average achieved across these six countries for 317 infrastructure projects worth $255 million is 82%. So of the problems that local citizens, communities, and public officials identified, they were able to fix 82% of them. In public services, the rate is lower, 28%, but still not insignificant. Right? So identifying a problem and then resolving that to the satisfaction of the main stakeholders. Now what we're suggesting with the fixed rate is that by introducing this unit of measurement, and I would suggest a you know, wonderful book that Pierre has written, absolutely by it, and in fact the fixes that he doesn't use the term, but the fixes that their partners have achieved are extraordinary, some of them, and definitely could be measured as fixed rates, as fixes. Now, once you introduce this concept of the fixed rate, you're able to compare different methodologies of intervention. You're able to say, ah, this method produces a fixed rate of 50%, the other one, 67%. You're able to compare their cost as well, right? If the 50% cost a tenth of what the other one costs, well, actually, we should look at it, right? Even if it only achieved a 50% fixed rate, if it's so inexpensive, $25,000, right, is really worth looking at, for example. And of course, we think it'll spur innovation. It'll spur learning as well. And let me give you, start with the first case study. So I was in Afghanistan just a few weeks ago. And, and with one of our best partners, Integrity Watch Afghanistan, we're proud of having contributed to starting that organization. And so they have, they're really the champions. They have done 281 projects, right? Very high fixed rate in an incredibly volatile setting. So before I'm going out on this field visit with our colleagues, the engineer who's about to accompany us tells me, and this is not included in the paper, I couldn't include it, but it's okay to share it orally. He said, this is the setting we're in. All the construction companies are owned by warlords. The governor has the biggest construction company, the mayor, and so on. Right? 
recently a supplier hadn't been paid by the warlord, by the construction company. And he was getting upset. He said, you know, you really ought to pay me. I've been waiting for a while now. The construction company says, okay, come. The constructor says, come to the office tomorrow. I'll pay you. Supplier shows up. Constructor pulls out a gun, shoots and kills him. That's how he deals with an unpaid bill. He's then arrested a couple of days later by the police. There's evidence, there are witnesses, said that this man was killed. And two days later, again, he's released because he's a warlord after all. He has references. Now, can you imagine that a uh, civil engineer or an inspector from the Department of Education right, is likely to confront that kind of constructor? Of course not. But even an NGO representative is never going to get away with confronting that person. Right? And yet that's exactly what community monitors are doing, not only getting away with it, but getting these types of people to fix the problem. So how are they able to do it? Right? Which, as I said, a public official never could, and an NGO person never could either. Now this is a school in Mazar Sharif. This is the courtyard where the children are still being taught in UNHCR tents. This is the school building. There are two school buildings, and one of them, the local monitor, her local volunteers in the community, one of them is a member of a Shura Council, was proudly pointing out to us the bricks he has, he has gotten changed, the whole roof he was able to get changed, the cement quality was changed, right? And then this is the completed school. But in a major program that UNICEF was funding, we found that 31% of the schools were practically unusable, practically unusable, dangerous to be in, actually. Right? Some of them would not survive. Some of them were absolutely uninhabitable or unusable. And that's because of the accountability measures that they have in place. A second case here in Narin, in the north of Kyrgyzstan. So here the community, through various focus groups and discussions, said our number one concern is solid waste. The city is very dirty. The waste management system is mismanaged. In fact, they had received a big grant from USAID to create a new facility, and yet it hadn't worked at all. And through a process that I'll describe in a moment, community got together, and actually they were willing to pay money for it. So Pierre was talking about local resources. In fact, they're local citizens, not a philanthropist. Local citizens put in money, and they were able to raise revenues money manifold. This is now given as an example for other cities in Kyrgyzstan of how to manage solid waste. The city is clean. Here in Kwale County in Kenya, this is a community, a small community, that hadn't had running water for the last six, seven years, where on average people had to walk 12 kilometers to get access to water. The cost of the fix was very, very low, but the fact is it hadn't been fixed. And, and the innovation here is, again, how can you produce fixes through transparency and accountability measures, not by putting more money at it, Right? Not by bringing in a consultant, not by calling on an aid agency, but through a transparency and accountability fix. And that's what they achieved. They now have running water. Final example from Hebron, from the south of the West Bank in Palestine. So here's a public discussion around water again. Right? Water is number one concern in the old city of Hebron where people often don't have mortar, water, running water on the tap more than once or twice a week. What they have to do then is to have water, access to water, they have to buy water from water trucks, which is much more expensive than the running water. They suspected city officials to be corrupt, and in fact that uh, relatives of theirs would have access to water which wasn't available to the public. So the deputy mayor of Hebron showed a recent receipt to prove that he also had to buy water from the water truck that it wasn't a case of wasta of corruption, as so many people suspected. In fact, that's one of the problems, is that often there is a perception of corruption that actually isn't justified. It may be maladministration, it may be fraud, it may be many problems. Sometimes it's corruption, but it often isn't. Ultimately, what matters to people is better water, right? sanitation, etc. They have now been able to double the water access in less than a year. So how is then that achieved? Five minutes, yes, so very quick. The remarkable thing about this is that it costs less than 1% right, of the value of the projects being looked at. So incredibly cost efficient, as Pierre was also highlighting. Now the method that was employed, and this I won't be able to go into, in, into any detail, 
But actually, the irony is that it in, has five phases, the same as Pierre outlines in his book and presentation. That we have three dimensions to it, accountability, competence, and ethics, and a five-phase process that we go through. I won't be able to go through that in detail, but just to point out that in the early phases of anti-corruption work, there was a notion that if we just did a good survey on corruption, it would motivate people to change. That hasn't worked. In a second phase of anti-corruption work, it was you produce the evidence base, monitoring. That will make people change. And that, in my view, again, is not sufficient. But we have developed a tool called Development Check that's going to be launched live next week, in exactly a week's time. And so it's developmentcheck.org. And we now, this is the first tool of its kind that we're aware of at least, that is a citizen feedback and collective action mechanism. So it's not just a means for people to capture images of what's wrong, but it's actually used as part of a collect collective action effort at change, and then captures the data on the fixes. It's currently being used in nine countries, and the data, as I said, will be live very shortly. So ultimately, what we want to achieve is constructive engagement and the closing of the loop in order to achieve a fix. So the second concept that I want to introduce to is the closing of the loop. You can't achieve a fix unless you have a theory and a practice of how to close the loop. Closing the loop is a feedback mechanism that triggers an intelligent response. And, and it's incredible in, to me, in, in a sense, but we learn this by doing it, how many theories of change, in fact, don't include a notion of what it really means to close the loop. Now, what is CIB not? It's not traditional anti-corruption. It's not a confrontational approach. It's not naming and shaming. It's not even a classic participatory development approach. Although it has many features of some of these things, it's not classic participatory development. Because participatory development de depends on an enlightened public sector leader, right, to do open budgeting, participatory budgeting, planning, etc. This, the innovation is it can be done without. So it's both bottom up and top down. It's constructive and it's about problem solving and it's about response and to people's needs. They wouldn't volunteer to be involved in these efforts if it wasn't something that was important to them. Right? There's no chance to get people mobilized unless it's really responding to their priorities. But we can also show that it has really a positive externalities. So this again is in Kwale County in Kenya. The community built a nursery and, and they have put together an integrity plan to the Ministry of Education to get the ministry to pay for the costs and to finish the building. And we have many other examples of how they've used these skills and applied them to other areas. Now, last concept here that I want to introduce to you is integrity versus compliance, to situate the work that we are doing as compared to others, and to show the work that actually hasn't worked as opposed to the work that does. So reactive compliance is classic anti-corruption work. And there's a certain type of fix to identify with that. Then there were efforts a while ago to develop what I would call reactive integrity, which is ethics-based, ethics advice centers, ethics officers. Then a great deal of innovation took place over the last 10 years and more in what I would call re proactive compliance. And that's where there's been enormous innovation. But I would suggest that the next set of innovations needs to be taking place around proactive integrity. And that the cases that Pierre was describing and that I'm describing, the ones I'm describing are squarely situated here. The ones Pierre was describing are partly in this quadrant and partly in the other one. Now, the, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a multinational corporation, of course you have to build your basis here and move out. The innovation is to see that in many of the low governance settings, if we call them that, this has failed completely. Right? The number of convictions of the High Office of Oversight in Afghanistan is zero, exactly zero. So this method hasn't worked. But this method is working in Afghanistan, same country. So to actually work backwards from there, we would suggest is the only way to make this effectively work. So coming back to the fix rate, there are different fixes for all of these. But the real innovation and the real driver for change is to make things happen in what we would call proactive integrity. And that's where we can get incredible returns, actually, and really make things happen from the ground up within the countries we are in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick. That was very good. Thank you. Um, and now um, Mark will offer some reflections for about 10 minutes. <laughs> 